Our next speaker is Meryl Marco. Meryl was the head writer for the original The David Letterman Show. She also shared in three primetime Emmy Awards for outstanding writing for a variety series for her work on Late Night with David Letterman. She won a Writers Guild Award for her writing and performing work on HBO's Not Necessarily the News, which I was a huge fan of, and has written for television shows such as New Heart, Sex in the City, and Moonlighting. Most recently, she has published a graphic memoir called We Saw Scenery, uh, The Early Diaries of Meryl Marco. And let me bring her on stage. Here we go. Um, in her own words, before we kick it over to Meryl, she says, what I love about comedy is the way you navigate yourself through a horrible situation. You paint an exit tunnel and walk out of it. You reconceive the facts you find unpleasant and untenable in a way that is tenable and makes you laugh. I think it's the greatest invention of mankind. I couldn't think of anything better. Meryl, thank you so much and take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Well, this topic is weirdly perfect for me because I live in, in the most combustible part of Los Angeles. I live in Malibu, and since last summer, we've been on fire at least four times. I personally have had to evacuate my home on three different occasions, and I was thinking I would just share with you what I've learned because nobody really uh, it does explain to you what you should expect or what you should do in these circumstances, but it looks to me like everybody at some point is going to have to evacuate their home, I, maybe not fires, maybe it's just gonna be floods or earthquakes or, uh, or man-made stuff like a shooting or a weird president who won't leave office. Whatever it's gonna be, um, you may have to leave. And so I thought I would uh, run you through my experiences and give you my pointers. Um, uh, in LA, it's almost always a fire. And it starts with what we have called the Santa Ana winds which are brusque, they're like 80 miles an hour. And um, when I first moved to LA, I thought they were kind of romantic and sexy because there's a Steely Dan song I really like called Babylon Sisters that has a repeating chorus, which goes, here come the Santa Ana winds again. Uh, that was before I lived through them and I realized that they were a trigger for the crazy people of Los Angeles to creep out of their hidey holes and their catacombs and head for the dry grass on the hillsides where uh, they dance a beguiling fandango, flinging lit matches in, so, in, in the idea that they can start an unstoppable uh, inferno. And you know what? They're really good at it. Uh, the first time that I had a uniform fireman come to the door of my house was 93. And I did not argue with the guy. Uh, I saw him and I went, fine, I'm leaving. So I put my four dogs in the car and dog beds and dog food and dog, whatever else. And then if there was any other room in the car and it was a Honda Accord, so there wasn't a whole lot more room. Uh, we left and started driving north on Pacific Coast Highway to I knew not where. No idea where I'm going. And this is when I realized that there were uh, two really distinct consciousness uh, in the car with me. One of them was uh, me freaked out. And the other were the four dogs going, Yippee, a walk, we're going for a ride in the car, to which I kept saying to them repeatedly as we're driving, uh, we're evacuating our home. That's very, very different from a walk, two whole different things, to which I could hear them replying, yeah, right, I bet it is. Um, so at that time, I had to stay on my friend's couch for a week. And when I came home, uh, I found out that I was the only person on my block who actually listened to the fireman and left. That was because I was the only woman who lived by herself on my block. And this is when I learned what the base level definition of masculinity in Los Angeles is. And it is this, it is that at some point in your life, you will eagerly seek to stand on the roof of your house with 30 feet of garden hose doing, I don't know what you think you're gonna be doing, but that turns out to be a theme for the men of Los Angeles, which I learned again in 2007 when we had to run through the whole thing again. This time was um, distinct for me because 2007 was the year that newscasters decided to add the word event to everything. I don't know what kind of meeting they had where this became necessary, but where they used to talk about the fire and the wind and uh, the Santa Anas. Now it was a Santa Ana event, a fire event, a wind event. All I could think of at the time was I don't know what kind of event this is, but I hope I didn't pay for tickets because I would really like a refund. Anyway, uh, 
it, it, early on, it was um, very strong winds, about 80 miles an hour. And so I walked out in my front yard to just see if there was any activity on my block. And I noticed that my next door neighbor, uh, the woman and her daughter were packing up the car. Where's dad? Um, uh, dad turns out, uh, to, he comes up to me and he goes, uh, Meryl, I'm going to stay. At which point, Andy, my husband, who now lived with me at my house, went, then I'm staying too. Uh, I, I felt I had to say something at this point. I went, what good are you two guys going to do standing on the roof with 35 feet of fire hose? There's not going to be any water pressure. You're just going to be risking your lives. We're told to get out of here, at which the guy next door looked at me in the eye and said, come on, Meryl, we're guys. We don't have much left. Let us have this much. Uh, cutting now to 2018, two years ago, exactly at this time of year, when uh, we, uh, we were gone for a month. That was a big one. That was called the Woolsey Fire. And uh, it started with an emergency text from the city. And uh, when I went out this time in the front yard to have a look at what was going on, there was a black cloud coming up over the mountain that looked like really terrible student CGI from the worst possible film. No professional uh, would ever have uh, agreed to this terrible special effect. And um, so then we knew we had to get out of there. So dogs in the car, stuff in the car, all that again. And uh, this time we race out to Pacific Coast Highway where we join a line of traffic that is going three miles an hour and is extending as far as the eye can see in both directions. Um, it took two hours to get the first five miles. And this brings me to my very first tip that I'd like to share with you. If in fact, it turns out that you will be fleeing from your home in a car, don't do as I do, do not hydrate first. Bad idea, I know it's always a good idea to hydrate, but don't hydrate because um, uh, I don't wanna to say too much, but all I wanna say is that I will forever be grateful to Dan Walker, who was uh, a man who played the character Haas on a 60s television show called Bonanza and donated a rest stop about 10 miles from my house. So I will forever be grateful for him. Uh, which brings me to my packing tips. These are my most important message for you because what you're gonna have to do before you get in the car or however you're leaving is pack a few things in a suitcase. And you are in such a frenzy of dissociated energy when you're doing this that uh, you, don't, you can do nothing but make bad decisions. So here's what I've learned. Because the first year that I left, I didn't pack any bras or underwear or socks. So the second time I packed, I remembered to pack a lot of bras and underwear and socks, but I forgot sweaters and shoes. So two years ago when I packed, I thought to myself, I heard a voice come into my head that said, Meryl, the important thing is morale. What you, what you wanna do is bring clothes that are gonna make you feel good. This is gonna be a really stressful situation. Just bring the clothes you like. And that's how I wound up for a month with a suitcase full of clothes that needed dry cleaning and two pairs of pants that didn't fit. Here's my advice for you. Remember this, pack for comfort and only comfort. Looking fetching is not an option when you're a refugee who has evacuated their home. Uh, there's only two looks you're gonna be able to pull off. One, the Dust Bowl photos of Dorothea Lange, or two, any photo taken by Diane Arbus. That is it. Um, you're not going to be able, you will at some point find yourself in public wearing plaid pajama bottoms and a straw hat and like maybe a duvet cover. Don't even resist it. It's going to happen. Uh, don't think poorly of yourself for it. it. There is a good piece of news about this and it's as follows. Um, whatever you pack for, it's like a superpower. Uh, you can control the climate with it. Like for instance, say it's been kind of chilly and you're hoping for warmer weather, pack wool or say it's been kind of hot and you're hoping for cooler weather, pack shorts. Whatever you pack for, uh, you're gonna get the opposite kind of weather. And um, this is uh, my idea of a personal letter from the universe that wants to, uh, that likes to back you into a corner and wants to remind you that really you can never truly prepare for anything like this. Um, also, one last thing, keep a box of stuff at your house somewhere with important papers in it, like um, birth certificate, passport, uh, insurance stuff if you have it, a pink slip to your car if you have it. Um, and also what you're gonna need a lot of is the passwords and your usernames for all the websites that you use. Because when you're away from home, 
it turns out you're going to be really reliant on the internet. So, uh, you know what, now that I'm thinking about this, not a single password or username that I wrote down on that list ever let me into a website the whole month that I was gone. So forget I said that one. Just pack for comfort and uh, good luck and stay safe.